Hola, buenas tardes. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for our final CUNY NICEP webinar, A Blueprint to Incorporate Translanguaging in Dual Language Bilingual Education. We're here with Cristian Solorza, the Bilingual Program Director at uh, Bank Street College, as well as two New York City bilingual teachers, um, Gladys Aponte and Timothy Becker. Ophelia Garcia will also join us as a discussant at the end of the presentation. First, we'll have Cristian Solorza talking with you. And um, here he is. Cristian, welcome to CUNY NICEP. Thank you for joining us. So I'm Cristian Solorza, director of the Bilingual Dual Language Programs at Bank Street College of Education. Now, I also teach uh, a course in bilingual curriculum. And um, Bianca Frias and Tess Leverant created a first grade unit of study on family. Gladys Aponte and Tim Becker created a fourth grade unit on Native Americans in New York. And one of the things that we wanted to do with Ofelia Garcia and Maite Sanchez is to envision what translanguaging uh, would look like in a dual language bilingual classroom. And one of the questions that I often get asked is, how is translanguaging different from code switching? Now, in a recent visit to, to Scotland, um, to the Scotland Street School Museum in Glasgow, um, we visited a school, which is now this museum, and the building is designed by a famous architect, and the design is actually something to admire. However, one of the, the features that I wanted to notice and focus on in this presentation is the idea that this school has a feature that a lot of our schools here in New York City have, at least the old schools, they have separate entrances for boys, girls, and in this case, for infants. And this society, this society felt that boys and girls should be educated separately, and so the building was designed to reflect this idea. Um, and so you'll see the a picture at the bottom here of a gate, and this gate separates the, two, the, the playground for where you have a space for girls to play and a space for boys to play. And the entire curriculum is actually designed for boys and for girls. And so I wanted to connect this idea to our concept of language. So for a while now, we've thought of a bilingual person as two monolinguals and one person. So you see the visual here of this, of this woman who speaks uh, home language and English. So we have this binary idea that impacts the way we envision dual language bilingual program designs and curriculum. However, bilinguals are not simply the sum of two monolinguals. And like the two sides of the playground, we have distinct and separate spaces in dual language programs. So the design of dual language programs reinforced the binary that said languages, Spanish and English, are to be learned in isolation. And so like the physical playground gate, we have strict guidelines about how we design language spaces in dual language classrooms. So we have various language models, such as English and Spanish zones, half day English, half day Spanish, week by week, content language allocations where we teach math in Spanish, um, or social studies in English only. And so if we return to this idea of the playground gate, and related to code switching, uh, we can see that one, in, in this example, boys cannot play with girls. And in this case, we also have the idea where we don't mix the languages. So in a way, we, we think of code switching in this way. We don't want students to mix languages. And, and so we often look down on code switching. And so I like Ophelia's idea of how she, she conceptualizes this. She, she thinks of an iPhone, and on the iPhone, we have a language keyboard. And when you try to write uh, the way that we think, bilinguals think, we often write both in Spanish and in English. And it's often annoying because we have to click this button so that we can then get the correct spell check. My name is often correct, uh, spelled wrong because my name is spelled as a, uh, as a Spanish name, so without an H. And so my name often gets corrected as Croatian. So, our language flows more naturally. So translanguaging theory complicates this idea by saying that we don't have two language systems, we have one language system. So translanguaging assumes that the speaker uses one language system to communicate and that we incorporate language features from said languages that we call in this case English and Spanish. Therefore we play on one integrated yard where boys and girls interact freely and they decide how and who to play with. So we use all of our linguistic resources to interact with our audience. There's no gate separating English and Spanish language features. So let's look at Jose. So here's Jose, who was born in Mendoza, Argentina, and speaks Spanish and English. Now Jose uses one linguistic system, and I've drawn this circle around him, which I'm calling his personal language space. 
Um, and he uses all his, his linguistic features to interact with his audience. And this includes deciding which languages, which language varieties are appropriate depending on context and audience. So for example, when speaking to his Argentine Mendocinos, Spanish-speaking parents, he speaks primarily in Spanish, and then he uses a little bit of English here and there. When he speaks to, if you look at the top, Benson, to his Bensonhurst-born white male principal, he's using language features that are formal and English. Now, when he speaks to his Taiwanese-born crush, uh, he speak, he's trying to use all of his linguistic resources to impress his crush. Um, and he might even include Mandarin or Taiwanese phrases and, and, and words. Now, for his newly arrived Dominican best friend, he can only use Spanish. And f with his Colombian-American bilingual teaching assistant, he feels free to use all of his linguistic resources, Spanish, English, formal, and informal. So a personal translanguaging space exists around every child. So how do we as educators become aware of our students' use of linguistic resources? We use observations and assessments. So let's go back to Jose. How does he use his linguistic repertoire with his audience? So the only way we can find out is by listening and, and looking at his responses and seeing how he reads. So for example, if you look, the, uh, look at the top, during a class discussion in English with his African-American teacher, and notice I use, I'm, I'm trying to give you a sense of the audience. Um, I think it's important to think about the racial, racial linguistic theory that's, that's being developed out there um, by Flores and Rosa, for example. And so if we think about class discussion, again, in English, we can look at Jose's ideas in English that are charted on paper. If you look on the, on the left, small group science work with two English-speaking friends and one bilingual non-friend, we can look at the handout that's completed in the Spanish target language to see what Jose is able to produce in collaboration with these, two, with these three individuals. In a turn and talk with a reading partner who, who happens to be a bilingual friend of his, we can note his ideas and words that he used orally, both in English and in Spanish. In a turn and talk with the math partner with a non-friend, he happened to ignore him. He didn't talk to him at all. So having being a friend or not a friend is really important. Now, in a reading conference for, uh, with the bilingual teaching assistant, she's able to assess Jose's reading comprehension of an English J-level book in both Spanish and in English. So you can see that Jose actually ended up using all of his linguistic resources in these interactions, regardless, regardless of the language, um, the target language. Now, so we want to think about assessment and differentiation differently here then. Um, so through this ongoing assessment, we can get a sense of Jose's uh, use of his linguistic resources and that translanguaging space around him. Um, and by doing this, we can then start to differentiate instruction not only for content, but also his specific language needs. So, so far we know that Jose uses all of his linguistic resources and chooses linguistic features specific to his audience. So he also, we also realize that Spanish and English features flow freely in his interactions and that, that there's really no gate or button separating the two set languages. So the challenge now becomes for us as a team, we thought about how do we redesign dual language bilingual spaces to use all of Jose's linguistic resources while also teaching in a target language, which we all know is very important in dual language settings. So we came up with this visual, and we, meaning uh, Ophelia Garcia, Maite Sanchez, and myself in collaboration with Tess, uh, Bianca, uh, Gladys, and um, Tim's work. Um, so if you look at the spaces, you have the space on the right that's in blue that we've designated as an English space. And you, uh, the space on the left, which is red, is a space designated as a Spanish space. So we tr we're trying to think about, okay, we want to maintain this design that, that is in dual language schools where we maintain a target language, um, but how do we include uh, or provide the space for children like Jose to use his entire linguistic repertoire? So you'll see how we mixed the blue and the red into this purple color to create these translanguaging spaces. So one thing that we felt was incredibly important was to create a translanguaging classroom community development, which you'll see as the first component here. Children, uh, we found that don't feel comfortable speaking Spanish during English time or speaking English during Spanish time. And so we really had to actively encourage it. The other thing is that they didn't feel comfortable speaking a variety of a language that was informal. Uh, most because a lot of times we don't value that, that variety in a classroom. And so the translanguaging classroom to community development piece is, it was essential. And it's something that takes a long time, and this is something that Gladys Aponte is actually going to talk about. Now, 
The translanguaging pre-assessment is also a space where we are allowing our students to use all of their linguistic resources so that we can figure out what the child knows, both about the content and the language. And if you look at component three, you'll see these circles. And those circles are circles just like Jose. So they, are, they each have their own translanguaging space around them, but we also have these translanguaging rings where we're differentiating instruction so that a child who, let's say, in, in the English zone, uh, is a Spanish speaker and is having difficulty learning English, we create uh, differentiation and supports that we are terming as translanguaging rings so that that child can interact with the content meaningfully while in this target uh, English zone. And those examples could be, uh, well, target, uh, translanguaging rings could be small group instruction, could be native language instruction, could be um, talking to a peer that speaks their language. On component four, we thought about translangu a translanguaging space where we wanted to com connect what they learned in both English and in Spanish, um, and a lot of it also to develop that metalinguistic awareness of language and also to bridge content similar to what Beeman and Ural discuss. And finally, on component five, we wanted to give them a chance to think about their culminating project and assessment to reflect and share what they learned both in English and in Spanish, and also to be able to communicate with the diverse um, audience. So the role of translanguaging becomes a space where we help our students continuously build on their language. Um, Spanish, and in this case, Jose says Spanish, English, formal and informal. And as teachers understand the linguistic needs of these of, of kids, they can better differentiate the students' content and linguistic needs. And this happens all the time, regardless of the, of the language of instruction. So, um, we have uh, a few questions coming in. So how can we adapt the mandated curriculum to meet students' linguistic needs? So I get this asked a lot as a consultant, and one of the things that happens is that people always frame it as uh, the children are a problem. Um, we have this, uh, they are not meeting the needs of this curriculum. One of the things I say to them, if the problem is not, the, not these kids, the problem is the curriculum. That we have to adapt, we have to develop a curriculum that is responsive to the needs of our students. Um, and so one of the things I would say is there has to be some curriculum development, there has to be some awareness of the, the content and linguistic needs of, of, of your students, and also what is, there, is your curriculum even culturally responsive to their interests and needs. Um, and so I, I just uh, summarize curriculum development and this ongoing assessment that I just um, shared with you with Jose is figuring out how the child uses language uh, throughout the day. Another question, how can a monolingual teacher harness a child's translanguaging space? So this is another one of those questions that I think is pretty difficult for, 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 for teachers. Now I think, in a bilingual dual language setting, we have to be able to work with the other language teacher. Now, if you're the monolingual teacher, let's say in the English zone, um, it's very, very important that um, your school finds time or, or builds in time for you to be able to share assessments while you are um, with the Spanish zone teacher so that you can learn what this child is able to do in Spanish. Um, a lot of also monolingual teachers also learn some Spanish in, in, in this case. Um, and I think that by recording examples or asking, um, looking at their written responses, you can only share their written responses when we allow them to translanguage on paper in writing and share that with the, the Spanish zone teacher and you could figure out um, what the child is able to communicate in Spanish and what ideas the child understands and what, what areas we need to support this child further in. So, um, now, uh, next in this webinar, we have Gladys Aponte, who's going to discuss translanguaging classroom community development. Um, and I'm just going to introduce Gladys Aponte. Thank you, Christian. I am a fourth grade teacher in uh, Jackson Heights, Queens, in a dual language class in which we alternate language daily, Spanish and English. And one of the things that I do from the beginning of the year is really develop a community in which students feel comfortable translanguaging. So some of the things that I will speak about today, as you can see on the slide, are uh, is translanguaging 
development of a classroom community in which translang students feel comfortable translanguaging and how translanguaging uh, promotes students' metalinguistic awareness. So as you can see in the picture, the pictures here, uh, my classroom door has two signs. One is in blue, uh, we're learning in English today, and the other one is in red, we're learning in Spanish today. Uh, nevertheless, the students know that we have designated translanguaging spaces, which is in purple, because if you blend, uh, merge the colors, it creates purple. And we speak about uh, reasons in, for translanguaging, and that's some, something I will speak about today. So here you can see there's a smiley with a zipper, his mouth is zipped, because this is what most kids come into, um, most kids that have been in a traditional uh, dual language classroom enter the year, uh, this is how they enter the year, in the beginning of the year when they uh, come in from traditional settings in which they are told, you know, it's a Spanish day, you can only speak in Spanish, it's an English day, you only speak in English. So it takes a lot of time, as Christian mentions, to really build that linguistic confidence for, for them to feel comfortable um, to share their knowledge in either language if they don't know how to say it in one or um, if they forgot and vice versa so that no one feels, no one is hesitant to participate and share the knowledge with others if they can't say it in the language of the day. Um, so in speaking about building a classroom community, one of the key things are building a community in which mutual respect and inquiry is emphasized, where diversity is valued, in particular linguistic diversity, and where authenticity is communicated. So one of the key things that I think makes my classroom successful, a uh, successful translanguaging classroom, but overall successful is the fact that I'm very transparent and authentic with my students. So my students actually know what translanguaging means and we speak about authentic reasons for translanguaging in the real world and in the classrooms. And some of the things that you need to really develop are seen to the right of the screen in which you see our classroom community norms which, norms, which we create together in the beginning of the year. And you can actually see translanguaging there with si se puede. And so we spoke about whether or not we wanted to translate that. And we agreed that we all can understand it in Spanish and it sounds more powerful in Spanish. So we included that there. But as you can see, well, um, we really emphasize mutual respect and perseverance, unity and optimism and diversity in my classroom. And we speak about cultural and uh, linguistic diversity in my classroom a lot. So in order for students linguistic repertoire to be assessed and invited, students need to feel uh, that they are unique and that they're bringing something valuable to the classroom. So we speak of students as being a, a resource and the fact that everyone's unique and everyone brings a unique resource um, and background to the classroom. I also share my background with my students. Uh, my parents are from the Dominican Republic and growing up I never thought that, that the Dominican dialect can be something that is, uh, can be shared with students since it's an academic setting, but we also speak a lot about um, how it's just as valuable, but maybe it's not accepted or by certain uh, contexts, certain audiences, and when it's accepted to use. And we also speak a lot about the fact that because we're so diverse, we can learn more words than other people who all come from Mexico or if, or if our classroom was composed of students and a teacher who all came from Ecuador and et cetera. Inviting the whole child into the classroom, we think about them bringing their cultural uh, linguistic background and something that I call your language back, uh, bank. So what is in your mind, what bank, what do you bring, what resources do you have to contribute to our classroom? And students know that and they all have something valuable to contribute. Uh, and in order to really promote this, you have to have an explicit conversation with the students in the beginning of the year. But I also ask them questions like, oh, that's so interesting. How do you say a little bit in your language? Or how do you say certain words in your language? And then towards the end of the year, it does take time. But after a few months, you can hear them asking me, asking each other. And as opposed to laughing when someone says, un chin, um, they ask like, oh, you know, why do you say that in your culture? And, oh, that's interesting. 
um, just like when we respond to someone who's eating a meal you've never seen. So we speak, we speak in terms of accepting and valuing and really being inquisitive as opposed to judging and you know making funny faces which you can see in the fourth grade classroom that doesn't have this type of uh, classroom community. Every member of the classroom community knows that we're here to learn from each other but they also know that we are each still developing our languages and that includes myself. So I'm always asking them questions and um, asking them you know how they say certain things and if they can you, teach me a certain word or vocabulary um, but we're also talking about why we should stick to the language of the day on an English day or Spanish day so it's not just that we can switch whenever we want we actually have to make an effort to stick to the language of the lesson or the language of the day so as I mentioned before authenticity is one of the key uh, aspects of my classroom and we embrace the fact that bilinguals translanguage naturally. So we speak about how we translanguage outside of school and in everyday life and what benefits translanguaging has. So even though we want to learn how to say uh, denominator in Spanish, the day that's the Spanish day, if you don't know that, you don't want to just say, oh, cuál es el denominator, right? So we want to continue learning. So, but even though we are allowed to translanguage in my classroom, we, um, we speak about the benefits of sticking to the language of the day, and then we think about benefits of actually translanguaging other than just learning a new word. Uh, one of the benefits of translanguaging is seen here, you can see in my anchor charts, and one is that it helps you determine the meaning of an unknown vocabulary. For example, as you can see in the chart to the left, Context clues is one thing that can help a student determine the meaning of a word, um, which, excuse me, monolinguals can also use. But other strategies that a, mo a monolingual can't use is depending on words that they already know in Spanish. So, for example, if you see the example in the chart, students knew what agua and tierra were, was, but then when they saw the word terrarium, even though they used the context and they tried using the word parts, they couldn't figure it out until I pointed out, think of your other language and you know, you have to access, uh, you have to really dig into your language bank to figure out words you already know in Spanish, not just in English. And they agreed, oh, you're right, we do translanguage naturally because this does help us. And now, it's something that if you really model and push them to do, they do naturally. So it also helps with metacognition and learning strategies. And you can also see with the word culprit, they had no idea what it was. They uh, can kind of figure it out with the context. But when we got to, uh, when I said there's a Spanish word that you can replace in that context, they all got it right away, culpable, which is culpable, but culpable is more of an academic word in English. And Spanish is a very, it's a word we use every day. Um, and then another chart I have, <coughs> it's seen to the bottom right, uh, what does it mean to interpret? So this is something that I teach students from the beginning of the year. When students interpret, uh, they're helping themselves understand something and they can do several things. They can simplify it as if they were explaining it to a second grader in either language, which I emphasize. They can translate it to a parent, to a foreigner, or to a kindergartner, so they can imagine they're back in Mexico and they're trying to explain this to their uh, aunt or to their five-year-old cousin. And then they can imagine they're trying to explain it to a kindergartner. So it really gives a sense of the audience and what they understand, and it helps them understand it better. So the sense of audience, as Christian was mentioning, uh, is, is really developed through translanguaging. And then one other way that we interpret in my classroom is that we rephrase it. So we say it in our own words which is something most teachers teach how to do, but I also emphasize the fact that they can say it in their own words in either language, whether it's in, even if it's an English or, whether it's an English or Spanish thing. So those are some ways in which translanguaging helps build metacognition and learning strategies. And you can see here that it also helps with learning new content. And I mean, it's all intertwined. They learn new content while they analyze words and they're, uh, using learning strategies and really, really applying it. So to the left, you can see that we were learning geometry and students were very confused when the math book said that a square is a rectangle. 
And then we, even though we went through the definition of a rectangle, it was an English thing, and what a rectangle is, it has five, uh, four right angles. Then I said, you know what, it makes more sense if we think of this in Spanish. And I left it open to them because this was just last month, so we've been translanguaging all year. And then they thought and thought and they said, oh, if I were to explain this to someone else in Spanish, I would say, oh, tiene cuatro ángulos rectos. And that recto part is in a rectangle. So then we said, oh, you know, we're very lucky to know Spanish because we can see that word part. And that'll help us remember why a square is a rectangle. And to the left, you can see this is a, a Spanish day, but it really helped them to understand the content of uh, counterclockwise and clockwise when we were learning the relationship between angles, uh, fractional parts of a circle and angles, which is a very complex lesson for fourth grade. Uh, but it really helped them to remember what counterclockwise meant and what contra el sentido, because it's very long, the translation. So counterclockwise in Spanish is contra el sentido de las manecillas del reloj. And we analyzed those word parts, counter and contra, and they were able to think of other words that, they, that reminded them of those parts in English and in Spanish. So it helped them remember, okay, if it goes clockwise, it's going the way that the clock, the hands of the clocks are going. But counter is contra, like if we're in a contest, a contest, we're against each other, I'm against you, it's just contra in, in Spanish or contrast, we're doing a lot of uh, contrast, compare and contrast writing, especially for test prep, and it really helped them to think about, oh, compare and contrast, we tell the difference is different than the way that the clock is going. So you can also see here some examples in which translanguaging uh, helps build metalinguistic skills. So here, uh, we can help students avoid transfer, inaccurate uh, transfer features that they're transferring from one, la one language to the next. For example, I often hear students say uh, more bigger than, so we spend time thinking about why we make, we transfer that, or why we speak that way, even though we don't, uh, it's, we're not supposed to speak that way in English. And then we realize, you know, it's not really a mistake in Spanish, but we're bringing it over to English, so it is a transfer. And now they're aware that if a word ends with ER, then we don't need to put, uh, we don't need to say more bigger. And things like that, other examples you can see on the, on the bottom, so it really helps them avoid mistakes like that, like those. In the rest of the slides, you can see other charts that I have in my classroom in which we analyze both languages and in which is really beneficial to uh, include both languages. At the bottom, at the bottom right, you can see a chart that I have up just to avoid transfers, again, that don't exist in one language or the other. So instead of saying, I infer your infiero, they can, they have these alternatives. Uh, we can assume that, but so that students don't say, puedo asumir, uh, or they don't say, uh, puedo concluir. We want to use more sophisticated ways in the, that you can see in the red side, as well as the punctuation, which varies in Spanish, which you can see there, and compare and contrast transition words. So in thinking of the audience with translanguaging, we also analyze why authors translanguage. Uh, Julia Alvarez and many other authors have translanguaged in their books. So it's really fun to analyze that and think about, you know, when should we translanguage in our writing? And it helps them make deliberate decisions for translanguaging. These are vocabulary words that we present on Mondays. So we all agree that it's more authentic to do it in both languages. Uh, on Mondays as opposed to having to present it in one in English and then on Tuesday in a different language because we use it in both languages throughout the week. So now there are some questions coming in and I will try my best to answer as many as I can. So I have, are all of your students Latino? Is this a one-way or two-way dual language classroom? So my students are, I'm a, in a I'm the only teacher, so I teach in English one day and Spanish the next day. And so it's self-contained as some schools call it. And I have, I'd say about a third of my students are Latino. I have Korean students and Caucasian, but the, a lot of uh, majority are Latino. And it's great because some students also bring in their third language if they're tri trilingual. And we speak about that, how that can help as well. So I have a question about assessment, and Tim will actually be, be talking about that next. So 
take one more question. Uh, do the parents support the use of translanguaging in your classroom? Absolutely. My students actually tell me that they have conversations with their parents about why we can translanguage and how we should still try our best to develop both of our languages. But they tell me, oh, you know, I go home and I tell my mom that translang what translanguaging is and the benefits. And she agrees, even though she wants me to make sure I practice both languages and really develop both. Uh, we speak about how in real life, People do translanguage all the time, as long as you make an effort to develop both. So again, uh, back to the authenticity. Thank you for your questions. And now Tim will be coming up next. Thank you, Gladys. So I am also a bilingual teacher here in New York City. Um, in my presentation, I'm going to be analyzing student work um, to think about how we can assess students in the translanguaging classroom in order to get the full picture of their linguistic repertoire. So when we were planning this unit, um, we had clear from the beginning that we wanted to use translanguaging throughout the unit, but we also wanted the students to produce um, at the end an essay written in formal academic Spanish. Um, so that was our language goal throughout the unit. And our content goal was we were looking at um, comparing and contrasting the way the students meet their basic needs with the way the Native Americans of New York State traditionally met their basic needs. So having established those goals, our next thought was, well, what will our students need to get there? And in order to know that, you need to start with pre-assessment. So when we're doing pre-assessment, we let the students ramble. That means we want to give them the opportunity to get all of their ideas out, um, even if they're not totally clear right now, even if they don't have the academic language for it yet, and when we're translanguaging, in whatever language it comes out in. So this is an example of a student um, who, for her um, pre-assessment, wrote in um, Spanish and in English. So this is the same student who wrote this essay at the end of the unit. Right now, though, at the beginning of the unit, uh, we sent home this assignment and the assignment was in Spanish, the instructions were in Spanish, but we made the allowance, if there's something you can't say in Spanish, say it in English. So looking at this student's work, what do we know about this student? The first thing that stood out to me was that she does have a very sophisticated understanding of how her family meets their need for food. Um, and she's referring to a variety of very specific ways they do that. They go to Whole Foods, they go to the farmer's market, they eat quesadillas, and so, um, this level of specificity might have been lost if we had forced her from the beginning to write just in Spanish. Um, we do see, however, that she is writing in Spanish from the beginning. Even when we give her the permission to write in English, um, she's making the effort to use Spanish where she can. So she's talking about quesadillas, ensalada, mama y papa. It's not much, but she has something. Um, and again, here's a, a sample from the same homework assignment this time talking about home, how they meet their need for shelter. And again, we see a variety of very sophisticated um, ideas about how her family meets their need for shelter. She even felt the need to cross out apartamento and write in basement, because apartamento wasn't specific enough for her. She wanted to say basement. Um, and she knows that their building is made of bricks, and she knows that her family wears sweaters. So she does have specific knowledge about how her family meet their needs for um, food and for shelter. Um, early in the unit, we are gathering information about our students as language, unit, as language users and about their content knowledge. So this chart is one way we can organize that information. So you see in the first column under basic needs vocabulary, I took the vocabulary from her pre-assessment and organized it. So we see that she has a variety of sophisticated words to talk about how her family meets their need for food and shelter. Um, we see that the majority are in English, but some are in Spanish. Another way we can gather information at the beginning of the unit is using class charts. So when we're having a discussion with the class, taking um, all of the responses from the students and recording them on a chart, it's a very natural way to take notes during a conversation um, that also leaves us with a record of what language the students are using. So allowing the rambling in both languages at the beginning of the unit gives us a fuller picture of where the students are. Now, 
that we have an understanding of this student in particular, we see that she understands a lot about how her family meets their basic needs, but she needs to continue to develop the Spanish to express that. Um, so for her, we're going to develop strategies that will help her do that. Another student might have sophisticated Spanish already, but less of a knowledge of how they meet their basic needs, and that student is going to need a different set of supports. Uh, this is one example of a support, um, and this again is a page from the same student. All of the samples are from the same student. Um, so for her, one strategy that could be very helpful for her is um, a personalized um, bilingual dictionary. So she's in charge of this dictionary. She chooses the words that go in it. Um, she chose basement because that was a word that came up in her pre-assessment that she didn't know how to say in Spanish, and she wanted to add that to her bilingual dictionary. Um, and this is one scaffold that she can use to push her towards using that academic Spanish. And in the picture below, you can see students um, using a list of compare contrast words and a bilingual dictionary there. Um, so as I said before, our goal is for all students to produce a compare and contrast essay in formal Spanish. We also want the essay to reflect uh, a distinctive voice and cultural perspective. So here we see that the student has learned the Spanish word for um, supermarket, supermercados, whereas before she was saying supermarket on her pre-assessment, now she's saying supermercados, but she's kept Whole Foods. She's kept that level of specificity that reflects how exactly her family gets their food. So she's using both the formal Spanish and the English that is more specific to her particular case. Now here she's talking about how, um, how we meet our need for shelter. And she starts by talking about here, you can see Birch Bark House. Now, why would she use Birch Bark House in this essay when we see just a line below, she also knows Corteza de Abedul. She knows how to say this in Spanish. Why did she choose to say Birch Bark House? Birch Bark House. One reason might be that Birch Bark House is an expression that's culturally bound, that's specific to the Native Americans of North America. And so that most of her audience, if they've encountered this word before, are likely to have countered it in um, English. So when she chooses to put Birch Bark House in English first, she's acknowledging the resources her audience most likely comes to this with. She also then goes on to say Corteza de Abedul. In effect, she's teaching her audience what Corteza de Abedul is. And again, um, she's talking about how she lives in a basement apartment. Um, and she keeps that word basement, which is a very specific reflection of where she lives and how she talks about where she lives and what um, other students and community members living in New York probably use to refer to that space. But she's added sotano, um, which is the formal academic Spanish word for that. So by allowing translanguaging throughout the unit, um, we were able to support her growth in formal academic Spanish while keeping these details that might have been lost had we forced her to start writing in Spanish from the beginning. Okay, uh, we have some questions. The first one is, can you talk about the makeup of your class? How many are Latinos? Uh, the majority of my class um, are Latinos. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean they're Spanish dominant. Um, I would say about uh, half of our students start as Spanish dominant students. The other half are, there's some Latino students um, who maybe speak some Spanish with their grandparents, but mostly speak English at home with their parents. And the rest are African-American, white, um, a variety of other students. Um, the question is, which curriculum do you use, and how do you adapt it in your bilingual classroom? Um, so this social studies curriculum um, in my school is, um, is totally teacher developed. It's based on the New York State standards, um, but then we develop the curriculum based on trade books and other resources we have um, to meet the need of all of our students. Um, another question is, can you talk about the formal assessments you use uh, for Spanish? So in this unit, our formal assessment the, um, was the essay. That was the culmination of um, all of their work in the unit. The question is, does translanguaging work against students' development of Spanish or of English? 
Um, we don't feel so. We feel that um, allowing those students that ability, like we were talking about at the beginning of the unit, to ramble in both languages, we then can build on that as a foundation. So if a student um, comes in knowing something in English, we then have a foundation to build upon to connect the words in Spanish to a concept they already have in English and vice versa. Um, so we view it as a tool to develop both languages rather than as something that holds them back. Um, like I said at the beginning, we had very clear that we wanted the students to develop formal academic Spanish. In both of our classrooms, we find in by fourth grade, the students are starting to prefer English. So we really are pushing the Spanish and wanting them to develop that formal academic Spanish. And we see that um, using translanguaging can be a support for developing the Spanish. It doesn't hinder it. Um, this is a fourth grade classroom. Both of us teach in fourth grade classrooms. Um, one of the questions that I get a lot from administrators is, um, or well, I get a fear from administrators saying that translanguaging does not belong in the classroom, especially in a dual language setting. Um, hopefully you'll see that uh, there are specific spaces for translanguaging to occur, even when we are in a Spanish-designated uh, time. Um, I firmly believe that we do need this designation, uh, this focus on language learning. Um, however, we have to keep in mind who our students are again. Um, we have to think about the curriculum as being responsive to the students that we have. Now, um, it doesn't mean that we have a free-for-all. Um, I think that the examples that, which are, is a phrase that I hear a lot, um, it, as you saw Tim and Gladys, is exam for, well, from their examples, you saw really specific strategies that they used that were not random, they were planned, they were reflective of their kids' needs. Um, and the charts that, that Gladys um, has in this presentation are very clear and specific to the curriculum itself. These are not random things that just happened. Um, so in order to do translanguaging in a classroom, um, it means that we have to have a good sense of who our kids are, how they're translanguaging, how they're using language, what are their linguistic resources, um, and then try to make connections to the curriculum and see where they need uh, support in English or in Spanish, where they need um, that native language text so that they can read about the content while they're learning the language. Um, and also uh, to think about how they feel in this language learning process as well. Um, if you are forcing a kid to speak only in Spanish when they're beginning English language learners, um, you are preventing them from sharing all that they know with you in that moment. And so we do have to create deliberate spaces for them to share what they know and feel comfortable in your classroom. Um, so again, this is careful planning. This is not something that happens randomly. If, you are trans if you're translanguaging constantly as a teacher, then that might be an indication that you maybe haven't planned explicitly and haven't thought about your linguistic and your content goals. And maybe you d haven't thought about what resources you have or need in Spanish, per for example. Um, in that case, if you find yourself translanguaging constantly, then you do have to step back and, and see where I'm going with this. Let me look at my assessments and how I'm going to plan accordingly. So I'm going to introduce you to Ophelia, who needs no introduction. Thank you so much, Christian and Tim and Gladys. Um, you know, one thing that really excites me about this group is that they have taken this on uh, and they have tried to use it within a curriculum for a dual language bilingual program. I think not many people have done that. I think this is new. Um, I think that this blueprint that they are establishing is extremely valuable. We're gonna have it up on our website. It's not, not there yet, right, Christian? But it will be up uh, so that you can all take a look at what is being done and how uh, these teachers have really developed um, uh, the, uh, the use of translanguaging within a, a fourth grade curriculum and a first grade curriculum. So I think, uh, I think this is really innovative and great work. So thank you so much for all your good work, Christian and team. Um, I think this is the last webinar uh, on, um, for, for the CUNY NICEB on bilingual education. And I think it may be important to just remember in the beginning 
what it is that we do and why we do it. Why is it that there is even bilingual education? Because I think that maybe in the last 10 years we have forgotten where we got started and we have forgotten that bilingual education is for children and it is to make sure that what we equalize educational opportunity for children. Um, so as my Frisian friend uh, always said, bilingual education cannot be just for languages, it has to be for children. And I think that the work that Christian and his team do really uh, shows how to take this concept of making sure that you develop bilingualism, but that you develop bilingualism within um, the context that exists, uh, not as something artificial, not as something that is made up, but for the community and with the community and by the community. So this is extremely important, this idea that uh, it has to work for minoritized communities. It has to put these minoritized communities uh, in power again. And I think that this is something that we have to recapture that we have forgotten about as we go along uh, establishing these dual language bilingual education programs that are not new, certainly not new, certainly um, 1963 Coral Way um, was started in Miami-Dade County and certainly that was an example of dual language bilingual education and I think if we look back at the 18th century we can find a lot of examples of that do, of what we call today dual language bilingual education uh, in St. Louis and in other places. So, um, so this is a new uh, dual language bilingual education is not new, what we always call the LBE to make sure that we remember that this is a bilingual program, um, but it certainly sometimes takes on um, some characteristics that are completely artificial and that are about the languages and not about the children. And I think the work that Christian Solorza and his team are doing is precisely about bringing back um, a, a program for the children and for the community and making sure that we're edu educating equitable and that we recapture this feeling of equal educational opportunity, which is what we all want for our children, while of course, at the same time, developing the bilingualism that is so dear to the community by um, making sure that we acknowledge and we legitimize ways of speaking of the community, of a community that, that is bilingual and therefore does not separate the languages in that, that way. Now that doesn't mean that schools um, do not uh, acknowledge not only this reality, this li the linguistic reality of the community, but extends that linguistic reality so that they acquire uh, a, what we might call a more formal English or a more fo formal Spanish and so, so that they can really um, uh, uh, function in uh, whatever society they select. But in order to do that, you have to start with acknowledging and valuing the language practices of people. And the language practices of the bilingual community are much more than just simply formal Spanish or simply formal English, because after all, we have known for a very long time that languages in contact create differences and we have to acknowledge those differences. So I think part of the work that they're doing is precisely bringing it back to, um, to the community. Um, I love the way that Christian started by reminding us the, of the playground um, and then thinking about what is it that we can do to bring the boys and the girls and those who speak differently because after all bilingualism is not a dichotomy, it's not monolinguals on one side and bilinguals on the other, but as Tim uh, pointed out and, and uh, Gladys also pointed out, many of their Latino children are in a bilingual continuum, that is they're not English language learners, uh, and they are not fluent Spanish speakers or, or, English, or fluent English speakers. We operate in a continuum and that continuum continuously changes depending on the task that we're asked to perform. Maybe if we're speaking, we are at one end of the continuum, but if we're, ask, we're being asked to write a formal essay, we're at another end of the continuum. So that this all changes and we have to be aware of that. 
I want to remind you that translanguaging uh, as a concept was established, and I've always said this, it was established and coined in Wales, in Welsh, um, and it's, it was established in what I called in the border. That is, translanguaging has been coined and has been worked for the benefit of the language minoritized community. Uh, it was picked up in the UK in the work of Angela Creese and Adrian Blackledge, certainly in after school ethnic uh, programs. And it certainly has been used in the United States also to recognize the language practices of language minoritized communities, of bilingual communities. And the idea, of course, that uh, bilingualism is not additive, as we were taught to think uh, in 1974 by Wallace Lambert in Canada, but that bilingualism is a lot more dynamic, especially today in uh, an era of globalization, of a neoliberal economy, of what Vertovec has called super diversity, which is, I think, evident in all our classrooms. So that um, we have to engage also with um, with the, the aspects of power and hierarchy, language hierarchies. And I think bilingual education has to work against these hierarchies that we have established if we're going to really educate um, powerful uh, minorities and for the future. Um, so I love this idea of the children uh, now, boys and girls playing in integrated ways in the yard. Um, playing freely, but like um, Christian just reminded us, not randomly, right? By translanguaging is strategic. Uh, there is a lot of planning that has been, that has taken place both in Gladys's uh, units and in Tim's use, uh, units, a lot of thinking that has gone into it. So it is not just a free for all, but actually uh, a way of, um, in some way harnessing the linguistic uh, richness of, of the, the children and giving them voice, not thinking not just of language as a product, but thinking of the process that leads us to the, the, to the product. Um, so the idea of making sure that we see these children not because of what they lack, but of their strength, and to make sure that we work to develop their voice so that you saw in Tim's presentation the idea that to write a, an essay in formal Spanish, you have to start with giving the students voice. And that voice sometimes takes uh, some uh, features of one language and features of the other. And that doesn't mean that, that, that you're going to stay with that fluidity. It means that you're going to eventually extend it. But I think the place in which we start as teachers makes a difference. So starting out as thinking that we're only teaching English or we're only teaching Spanish or starting out as thinking that these children come with a full repertoire that we have to in some way extend, that makes a very, very big difference. And I think that that's part of what the work that they've been doing. Um, I think that, again, the emphasis that they have uh, given us is one of working for the children and not just working for the language. And I think that this is evident in all the aspects of their curriculum development. The idea that there is pre-assessment. Uh, Tim talked about letting them ramble. Uh, why do we let them ramble? We let them ramble so that we know what they know and we know how they know it. Uh, and we know in which language they know it. If you don't provide a space in which the children actually can do this, you don't know what they know. You don't know what it is that you need to extend. You don't know what it is that you need to support. And so I think that this is extremely important. And then what uh, Gladys told us, the whole idea of um, uh, making sure that you start out by building a, a community, a, a community of practice that values translanguaging, so that it is not just um, because, after all, children by the fourth grade really know that they are only supposed to use certain features of certain languages at certain times. And what I think uh, Gladys' work does is allows them to uh, understand that they can use their full repertoire to learn, that they can actually, like the rest of us do, right? So that they can actually use it, bring it forth 
as they work in one language or the other. Um, I think that the idea that then you can assess the child because then you really know what it is that they, that they know uh, and meet their specific language needs. Um, I want to make sure that I repeat something that Christian started out with and that I think was prevalent, was uh, something that was very obvious in the two presentations. The idea that you still are keeping the spaces, uh, uh, one blue, one red, one English, one the other, the language other than English, but that you, um, by knowing the students, you can then uh, have what Christian called the translanguaging rings around them. They're safety rings. Otherwise, what you're doing is you're immersing these children in a language that they may not know. And we, as bilingual educators, are always very critical of submersion in English only. And yet, we sometimes set off our programs without giving the children the, the appropriate scaffolds, the appropriate translanguaging rings to make sure that they know what they know. And then I think beyond the scaffold, I think is the idea of how do we transform and how do we make these uh, students critical of, what, uh, of, of language hierarchies and the way that language functions in society. And how do we then transform uh, the communities so that they become um, more empowered at doing something. So um, I, I think that says it all, and I really want to thank this team for this uh, wonderful work. I want to uh, remind you that this webinar will be archived on our webpage uh, and yet that you che should check out our webpage periodically for updates. And you will also receive an email uh, with a short online survey, and we really appreciate it if you would uh, fill it out. This is the last of the webinars. It has been a fascinating um, uh, journey, and we were, we're very happy that you have taken this journey with us. Y muchísimas gracias. Adiós.